Six acres of Arizona land sat abandoned, declared hopeless. A United States Department of Agriculture food desert where 90% of residents lived in aging trailers and there was not a single grocery store or park within five miles. In a place battered by summer temperatures that reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit and crippled by relentless drought, most experts gave up. But in 2006, a handful of neighbors decided to rewrite that story, and what followed would upend every assumption about what desert communities can achieve. What transformed this barren wasteland into Arizona's most biodiverse garden? The answer begins with the crisis that left this neighborhood desperate for change. On the edge of southwest Tucson, census maps drew a hard line around a place the USDA called a food desert. The nearest grocery store sat more than five miles away. Nearly every home was a trailer, 90% of residents lived without a yard, without a park, and without access to fresh produce. The land itself had been left for dead. Six acres of hard-packed sand and gravel, county owned but forgotten, bordered by chain link and the heat shimmer of the Sonoran summer. For decades, the only crops that grew were rumors and wild tumbleweeds. Federal data made the crisis plain. In this census tract, poverty rates ran high and car ownership was low. Families survived on canned goods and convenience store snacks while children played in the dust. The USDA Food Desert Atlas listed this neighborhood among the most underserved in Arizona, a stark statistic in a state already known for its water scarcity. Isolation shaped daily life. With no public green space, no playground, and no safe place to gather, residents spent long stretches indoors, windows shuttered against afternoons that reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Local health workers tracked rising rates of diabetes and heart disease, fueled by diets heavy in processed food. For many, the lack of fresh vegetables was not just an inconvenience. It was a risk factor for chronic illness. Maria Gutierrez, who would later become the project director, remembers those early years. It was not just about food, people felt invisible out here. We were cut off physically and socially. The empty lot at the heart of the neighborhood symbolized more than wasted land. It stood for a system that had written off thousands of residents as unworthy of investment. Public records show that by 2005, the area had gone decades without a single new park or community space. Mobile home residents, many on fixed incomes, had no means to travel across town for groceries. The land itself was so barren that even city planners considered it unusable. Yet the need was undeniable. In a census tract where most families lived below the poverty line and where the only open space was a wasteland, the question was not if something had to change. It was whether anyone would step up to make it happen. In early 2006, a small group of residents and advocates gathered at a Pima County board meeting with a proposal few believed would succeed. The request was a long-term lease for six acres of county-owned wasteland to be used as a community garden in a neighborhood the county had labeled unfit for public investment. The minutes from that meeting reflect a rare consensus. Board members, facing maps that showed a five-mile ring of emptiness, approved the lease. For the first time in decades, the land had a legal purpose beyond neglect. Maria Gutierrez, soon to be named project director, described the moment as a breakthrough. County officials, including a liaison from the real property office, signed off on access, but with clear warnings. The soil was classified as pure sandy gravel, incapable of holding water or nutrients. Tucson's climate data left little room for optimism. Average rainfall hovered at just 11 inches per year, with some drought years dropping below 5 inches. Summer temperatures routinely soared past 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The lot surface was so compacted that even mesquite trees struggled to take root. There were no irrigation lines, no shade, and no infrastructure of any kind on site. The county's own assessment listed the parcel as non-arable, a designation usually reserved for land slated for industrial use or long-term vacancy. Yet the legal lease was only the first barrier. The community now faced a series of technical and physical obstacles that would test both resolve and ingenuity. 
County engineers flagged the absence of water rights and highlighted the lack of any existing collection or delivery systems. Local extension agents warned that any attempt to grow food would require a complete transformation of the substrate from sterile sand and gravel to living, moisture-retentive soil. The project's earliest plans, submitted for county review, called for the import of organic matter by the truckload and the installation of basic fencing to deter illegal dumping and off-road vehicles. Residents volunteering for the first workdays found themselves battling not just the elements, but decades of debris and compaction. Shovels bounced off the ground. Wheelbarrows bogged down in loose stone and dust. The county liaison assigned to monitor compliance and safety became a crucial bridge between the grassroots organizers and the bureaucracy. While the lease allowed access, every improvement required additional permits and inspections, from temporary water tanks to the eventual construction of shade structures. The legal foundation was finally secure, but the real work, turning a barren lot into a place where food could grow, was just beginning. Each challenge underscored the scale of what lay ahead. This was a project where the only certainty was the harshness of the desert itself. Digging into desert ground that barely holds a shadow, the first garden volunteers faced a riddle as old as Tucson itself, how to keep water from vanishing. In the Sonoran summer, a single inch of rain can disappear before it ever reaches a seed. The solution, drawn from both ancient and modern desert science, lay in going lower. Instead of building up, they dug down, creating sunken beds, each one a shallow basin carved below the natural grade. Rain and irrigation pooled here, not on the surface, but where roots could reach. The design was simple. Gravity pulled every drop toward the heart of the bed, and thick layers of mulch locked in precious moisture. According to the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension, this approach can cut evaporation losses by as much as half compared to traditional raised beds. In a climate where pan evaporation can top 100 inches a year, that difference is survival. A University of Arizona desert agriculture specialist explains that sunken beds work with the landscape, not against it. By concentrating water below grade, the system protects it from wind and sun, and keeps soil temperatures lower. It is a method validated in research plots and community gardens across the southwest. But rainfall alone would never be enough. Tucson averages just 11 inches per year, and in drought years that number drops below 5 inches. To stretch every storm, the team turned their eyes upward. They installed tin-roofed shade structures, ramadas that offered more than relief from the heat. Each roof became a catchment, channeling rain through gutters and downspouts into storage tanks. The math is straightforward. A 1,000-square-foot roof in Tucson's climate can yield about 6,800 gallons of water in a typical year. With several roofs feeding a network of tanks, the garden could harvest and store up to 10,000 gallons, enough to irrigate crops through the longest dry spells without tapping the city supply. This system did double duty. The shade beneath the tin roofs dropped ground temperatures by up to 18 degrees Fahrenheit on summer afternoons reducing plant stress and further slowing evaporation. Water that might have washed down the street now cycled through the garden, supporting vegetables, fruit trees, and native perennials. Overflow from the tanks was routed into the deepest sunken beds, ensuring that not a single drop went to waste. The impact is measured not only in gallons, but in resilience. In years when rainfall barely wetted the dust, the stored water kept 80 garden plots in production. Evaporation losses were reduced by an estimated 60% compared to unprotected surface irrigated ground. The garden's water balance, capturing, storing, and distributing every possible drop, proved that even in one of America's driest cities, irrigation could be both viable and sustainable. The next challenge would lie beneath the surface, where the chemistry and biology of the soil itself had to be rebuilt from the ground up. Beneath the relentless Arizona sun, the transformation of dead gravel into living soil began with a single question. How do you make fertility take root where nothing should grow? The answer for this community lay in a blend of ancient technique and scientific rigor. Keyhole gardens, circular beds edged with stone, rose from the dust. Their design, 
borrowed from African drylands and adapted for the Sonoran climate, offered more than compact beauty. Each bed's stone wall stored daytime heat and released it at night, buffering the wild swings of desert temperature. At the center, a compost basket served as a living engine, fed daily with kitchen scraps and garden trimmings. Water poured into the basket seeped outward, carrying nutrients directly to the roots. This closed-loop system, simple to build and easy to maintain, allowed even first-time gardeners and elders with limited mobility to tend crops in a harsh environment. Education became the backbone of the project's success. Over 50 hands-on workshops each year covered everything from the chemistry of compost to the engineering of drip irrigation. Residents learned to test soil, pH, balance carbon and nitrogen, and diagnose the subtle signs of nutrient deficiency. The garden's compliance with Arizona Department of Environmental Quality guidelines ensured that every system, especially those reusing household gray water, met strict safety standards. Gray water, filtered through mulch basins and delivered below the soil surface, provided a steady supplement to rainfall and stored tank water. By capturing the outflow from laundry and sinks, the garden turned waste into resource, irrigating fruit trees and perennial beds without risk to edible roots. Companion planting strategies, rooted in agroecology, replaced chemical inputs. Beans and peas, planted alongside corn and squash, fixed atmospheric nitrogen and shaded the soil, reducing evaporation and suppressing weeds. Marigolds and basil drew pollinators and repelled pests, creating a living mosaic that supported both productivity and biodiversity. The Sonoran Desert Museum audit in 2017 documented the results. More than 80 distinct plant species, dozens of native bee and butterfly varieties, and a thriving population of beneficial insects. This diversity stabilized yields and reduced the need for outside intervention, even as temperatures soared and rainfall faltered. For many, the garden's impact was deeply personal. Among the volunteers, one cancer survivor described the plot as a lifeline. After my diagnosis, I lost my sense of purpose, she recalled. Working this soil, watching seeds become food, it brought me back to life. Her story echoes findings from clinical studies, which show that regular gardening can ease depression and anxiety, foster social connection, and improve overall well-being. The structure of the garden, shared labor, mutual teaching, and visible progress helped knit together a community that had once felt invisible. A University of Arizona specialist visiting the site pointed to the dark, crumbly earth now filling each bed. This is living soil, he explained. We started with sand and rock. Years of compost, cover crops, and careful water management have built a medium that holds moisture, supports microbes, and feeds plants. It is not just about growing vegetables, it is about rebuilding an ecosystem from the ground up. Every harvest, every workshop, every plot tended by a new hand added to the momentum. The garden's living soil became both a technical achievement and a symbol of what is possible when knowledge, persistence, and community converge in the face of the desert. At sunrise, the garden is already alive with movement. Rows of amaranth and chiltepin pepper glisten with dew, while squash vines climb the edges of keyhole beds. Each plot is measured and tracked, with production logs showing that, on average, families harvest close to 60% of their household vegetables here, a number confirmed by the garden's annual audits. The daily yield is not just a statistic. It is a visible abundance, with baskets of tomatoes, chard, and okra filling the farm-to-table kitchen by mid-morning. There, a small team prepares over 200 meals each week, relying almost entirely on what is grown steps away. By noon, the air is sweet with the scent of roasting peppers and fresh herbs. Every Saturday, the garden's farmer's market opens its gates. More than 500 residents from the surrounding neighborhood come to shop, trade recipes, and greet neighbors, many for the first time all week. The market's tables are heavy with produce, eggs from the garden's hens, and native honey. For families who once traveled miles for fresh food, this weekly event has become a lifeline. The Sonoran Desert Museum ecologist, Dr. Javier Morales, walks the paths with a clipboard, 
noting native bees, butterflies, and more than 80 plant species. In terms of biodiversity, this site rivals natural desert remnants, he explains. He says they have documented pollinators and wildflowers that simply do not appear elsewhere in the city. The museum's certification of the site as Arizona's most biodiverse garden is more than a plaque. It is a validation of years of careful planting, water management, and community stewardship. For the youth agricultural program, these findings become teaching moments. Children learn to spot swallowtail butterflies and identify edible desert greens, skills that connect them to the land and to each other. The garden's output is measured not only in pounds of food, but in the variety and resilience of life it supports. Each harvest, each species recorded, is proof that a functioning ecosystem can thrive even where maps once showed only wasteland. For the gardeners who tend these desert beds, the rewards reach far beyond the harvest. Peer-reviewed research in public health journals confirms that community gardening can significantly reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety, especially in neighborhoods facing poverty and isolation. Regular participation, digging, planting, sharing stories under the shade has been linked to lower stress, better sleep, and a renewed sense of purpose. In this Tucson garden, participants describe the space as a lifeline, a place where routine and physical work become a form of therapy and where neighbors become friends. The volunteer model, requiring just two hours of monthly labor for plot access and training, ensures that even those with limited income can take part. This system builds dignity and ownership, not dependency, while creating a monitored green space that supports both safety and social connection. The impact is not confined to a single city. According to United Nations estimates, more than 2 billion people worldwide live in regions classified as arid or semi-arid, places where water is scarce, soils are poor, and food insecurity is rising. The techniques proven in Tucson, sunken beds, rainwater harvesting, closed-loop composting, are already being adapted in dryland communities from Africa to Central Asia. As climate change accelerates, the need for scalable, low-tech solutions grows more urgent. This six-acre testbed in Arizona offers a blueprint, a way for communities facing the harshest odds to reclaim dead land, restore mental health, and build resilience from the ground up. Across the world, over two billion people live in arid or semi-arid regions, facing the same relentless pressures of heat, drought, and hunger that define Arizona's deserts. Here, communities prove that with ingenuity and grit, even the harshest landscapes become sources of life. As climate extremes accelerate, these solutions are not just hope, they are blueprints for survival. The future of food security may begin where most gave up looking, 